Okay, dear ladies and gentlemen, I hope everybody entered who wanted. I would like to welcome you once again. So, actually, also those who arrived in the meantime, who hadn't made it for the uh, opening session, we are now starting, as Professor Kracic said, with a real program, hard work. So, the first in a series of our invited lectures, plenary lectures, is uh, of Professor Detlef van Furen with the title of Untidying the Knot, Exploration to Meet Climate and Sustainability Goals. I'll just say a few words about Professor Detlef van Furen. Uh, he is a professor of integrated assessment of global environmental change at Utrecht University's Faculty of Geosciences and a senior researcher at Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency, PBL, where he leads integrated assessment modeling team. He has published more than 360 articles in peer-reviewed journals, including, including high-profile journals such as Nature and Science. He is among seven people worldwide who are listed as highly cited researchers in three different disciplines simultaneously. Professor Furen's work focuses on global sustainability issues. With his team, he develops models to explore future climate and environmental changes through scenarios. Professor Detlef van Furen is a member and board member of the Integrated Assessment Modeling Consortium, the Earth Commission as a part of Future Earth, and the Global Carbon Project. He is a deputy editor of the scientific journal Climatic Change, which is a leading interdisciplinary journal on climate change. He participated on a number of different boards and initiatives, uh, many of which are used as, uh, in the IPCC assessments. I want to read uh, further. His, uh, his uh, biography is very impress impressive. It would take, took me five mi few mi minutes but uh, I won't steal his time, and uh, I will give Professor Furen the floor, actually the cloud. Please, Professor. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the kind words. I will share my screen, and I, hopefully it goes to the right presentation mode. Um, it should be uh, only the normal presentation mode and not in... Uh... Is it correct? Can you confirm? Okay, I assume it, I assume it is. Um, so, uh, I sorry that I couldn't be here uh, today. Uh, so I will do my presentation um, via the, the web, via the cloud. But hopefully, uh, you will still enjoy it. And my presentation will be about untying the knot: explorations to meet climate and sustainability goals. And we are living in very special times. Eh? So this is our governments have promised a lot of things with respect to environmental protection. Now we have the Paris Agreement in 2015, where we have promised to stay well below two degrees and preferably 1.5 degrees. We have for, for, for biodiversity, the Aichi targets, also recently agreed that we would uh, make sure that we would protect biodiversity. And in the same year as the Paris Agreement, also the Sustainable Development Goals were signed, where we promised as well to end poverty protect the planet and ensure that all people could uh, enjoy peace and pros prosperity. But at the same time, uh, the world is not really moving in this direction. Uh, I'm just showing you in the middle of the CO2 emissions, which simply increased further since the Paris Agreement was signed. And also, for instance, the media release of the IP Best report, which says that nature dangerous decline is unprecedented. Uh, and so, our common task as environmental scientists, you in the room, in Dubrovnik, myself and others, would be what is needed to achieve these goals? How can we make a difference? How can we bend this trend? That is quite a difficult question. Uh, it basically says, how will the future evolve? Because most of these things pr uh, promise things for the future. In my work, I try to contribute to this via scenario analysis and modeling. Um, but there are many ways, obviously, you could contribute to trying to ask, uh, to answer that question that I had on my previous slide. 
and hopefully by the end of the presentation we can also discuss how to really make these uh, different um, con contributions of ourselves work together. But focusing on that question on how will the future evolve, that's obviously very, very, very difficult. Yeah? So it, how will the future evolve for environmental issues? It depends on drivers like population and socioeconomic development, political changes. It depends on demand for materials like food, energy and water. It also depends on how these environmental problems develop themselves because there are feedbacks, uh, climate change feedbacks, feed, does feedback on many of these drivers. But not only that, we also somehow need to realize that there are different scales and decisions in Europe, for instance, on bioenergy might affect sustainable development in South America. There are different time periods, decisions that we make today uh, with building a coal plant will have an influence for the next 40 years because we this, the plant will be around for that time. But also, even worse, as CO2 molecules that we put into the, into the atmosphere today will be there for centuries. Um, and then uh, there's also uncertainty for all of these. And so at some point it becomes really too difficult for our mind to capture all those linkages. And that's where uh, models might come in uh, to start exploring things where we have relatively certain knowledge. But it's important to realize that none of these models are made to make predictions. <coughs> Decisions by humans or elections will totally change the future again. And so the only purpose that these scenarios and models can have is trying to explore different futures. Try to see, to, to, as, as you wish, to, to make a map of possible consequences in the future that are possible and the relationship between things that we might find, encounter on the way. Just to uh, indicate how important it is to understand uh, the linkages between issues, and here we have the Sustainable Development Goals, as they were agreed by the UN in 2015, and they indicate goals for all kinds of different topics like no hunger, uh, no poverty, but also protecting uh, climate change, uh, preventing climate change. Now, one of these goals says no hunger. And we know that between now and 2050, uh, the population will grow from seven to nine billion people. Uh, we also know that uh, uh, we would have to produce food also for those people that are currently suffering from hunger. And so the expectation is that if we just continue in the way that we are currently doing, we need to produce at least 60% more food in 2050 to be able to meet the goal. Yeah, that would potentially mean 60% more land. Yeah, but that, you know, if that happens, then you can forget about the goal to prevent biodiversity. And so, as historically was done, most of this needs to come from yield improvement and not land, uh, expansion of agricultural land. Which does mean more irrigation, more fertilization, more use of chemicals, with possible consequences for our goals to prevent climate water scarcity or um, in the case of fertilization uh, with uh, the use of nutrients with consequences for bi uh, aquatic biodiversity and climate. And so this is one route where you would need to look into these consequences. Alternatively, we could also try to uh, meet the zero hunger goal by assuming some diet change of those that are consuming a lot at the moment. And maybe they would consume less meat, uh, as a result of which we would have more uh, food available for others. You could meet the zero hunger goal and at the same time actually have a benefit for health given the overconsumption of meat at the moment. And so there are different roles to meet, to meet these SDGs and they have different consequences. And it's important to, to explore those. Just having a look at again at, at the 17 SDGs, they look a little bit messy. So one way to um, see them a little bit more organized is to put them in a framework where we realize that some of, the, some of them are about human development. Some of the SDGs are about efficient and sustainable resource use. Some about are really protecting the natural environment. And two of them are really about providing the good governance structure to meet the others. This maps quite well on the type of models that we are developing, and this integrated assessment models, where we describe the interrelationship between human systems and Earth systems, 
And in the human systems, we mostly focus on energy and agriculture. And then in the Earth system, we describe things like climate change, biogeochemical cycles, biodiversity. And, um, and then the most important interactions that we model in these integrated assessment models are emissions and land use. Uh, it is important to realize that if we describe these future systems, uh, that we are talking about different levels of complexity. One level is the, the world as we can touch it, the physical intent, uh, entities. Secondly, there's the, there's the world of, of laws and rules, like for instance, economic be behavior, which we can describe very well. And on the most abstract level, we have the, the things that even underlie that, our beliefs and our culture. Now the models are reasonably able to deal with this lower levels. And they can really nicely describe physical uh, entities and their behavior on the basis of natural laws. They can also nicely describe infrastructure and the consequences of investments into infrastructure and their depreciation over time. They can also quite well describe some economic behavior uh, by via economic rules, but they are relatively poor in describing, for instance, beliefs and culture and changes there. And so in using these models, we normally develop scenarios where we on the one hand have storylines to, to take up the most uh, complex layers of this scheme and then models to focus particularly on the strong knowledge that we have in the lower layers. Yeah, so we have model-based scenarios which are a combination of narratives and modeling. Modeling where there is enough knowledge to define quantitative relationships and narratives when there is complexity and flexibility. In the rest of my presentation, I will look a little bit on how we can use these tools to specifically look into uh, relationships related to sustainable development and climate. But I will start with climate research because scenarios are mostly used in this area and then see how that can be further expanded and then draw some, some conclusions. So first focusing on climate. Now, if we want to develop the scenarios that are relevant for climate, then they need to really cover the full chain of climate, of the causal chain of climate, which comes from drivers, population and economy, via energy and land use to emissions, to changes in concentration of greenhouse gases, to climate change, and finally impacts. Now, if you look at this system from the other end, from the impact side, side, and then you can see that there are two major things that determine future climate impacts. On the one hand, it's the climate itself, if we are living in a four degree world or in a two degree world, but just as importantly, it's the socioeconomic conditions. Just think of two countries that are suffering from uh, sea level rise. One would be a developed country with a lot of resources, able to respond and to invest in, in for instance, no dikes. Um, well, the other country might be a poor country where governance might not be as uh, successful. Uh, the impacts will be much larger, larger in the second case. And, and so it's not only the climate change that determines future impacts, but at least also the socioeconomic conditions. And in developing scenarios for climate research, we took these two elements and then started to develop scenarios that would fit into a matrix that had on the one axis the level of climate change going from 8.5 watts per square meter comparable to four degrees by the end of the century, which is a high uh, level of climate change, to uh, 2.6 watts per square meter originally, which is comparable to well below two degrees. And we, we, uh, we added later also scenarios at 1.9 watts per square meter, which is comparable to 1.5 degrees. And then we had a second axis where we wanted to look, in, look into the impact of socioeconomic conditions different storylines of how the world would develop. Now, to make those relevant for climate policy, we wanted to those two, those socioeconomic conditions to vary with respect to the two most important elements of climate policy, which are adaptation and mitigation. And so we defined, again, a matrix where we said, okay, we can have a world where it's relatively easy to adapt and easy to mitigate. Now think of the circumstances that would give such a world. Maybe if population development would be, would be low, population growth would be low. If people are working together, if technology development would be high, and then we create a world where it's relatively easy to adapt and easy to mitigate. Yeah, the opposite situation 
when will it be really hard to mitigate and really hard to adapt? And that uh, would be a situation where we have a lot of people. They are poor. They're not collaborating with each other. They're competing with each other. Uh, technology development would be relatively low. People are not sharing technology. And, and so we have now created a, a scenario line for an SSP1 scenario in the lower corner and an SSP3 world in the upper right corner. And you can also think of uh, narratives that would uh, be representative of those other situations, SSP5 and SSP4, and we did so. And we actually decided that it would be useful also to make a scenario that would be a medium scenario, which is called the SSP2. Uh, and this is actually interesting because as scenario developments, we always said, please don't develop scenarios in the middle because people will start to use only that one. But we realize that if you don't do that, uh, that people will anyway uh, often can only one, you apply one scenario and they would pick one of the corners and assume it would be a middle, middle scenario. So in this case, we decided that it would be useful anyway to also make a middle of the road scenario. Yeah, what we did, and this is already uh, a couple of years back, it's, I think, I believe it's 2015. Uh, we had a meeting uh, with uh, 60 people where we elaborated the narratives of these scenarios. Uh, originally in two pages, finally in about 10 pages per scenario. The work is uh, published uh, under the title, uh, under the first author, O'Neill et al., where we really described five possible futures, five possible stories about the future world. And I already taught, taught you a, bit, a little bit about the SSP1 world, which then is now known as, as a green growth world and the SSP3 scenario where there is competition between uh, people. And the next step was to see whether we could ask modeling teams to, to elaborate these. And so we, for instance, asked population modelers and economic modelers, population modelers at the ASA and income, uh, economic modelers at the OCD to elaborate these scenarios and make projections for population and, and income uh, as shown here with, for instance, the very high economic growth in the SSP5 uh, and a very high population scenario in, the, in that regional uh, competition scenario in SSP3. Well, in contrast, in SSP1, as I indicated before, we would have a relatively low population development, going to 9 billion by the middle of the century and coming back to around 7 billion by the end of the century. And so we have a whole range. And actually on the back, you can, uh, of the color of the line, you can see where the UN lie, uh, scenarios lie at the whole range. So it's, it's, our scenarios are reasonably covering uh, the full literature. And the next step was to send both the narratives and these population and GDP projections to another set of teams, which are the integrated assessment modeling teams. And they were asked to elaborate these scenarios in terms of energy and land use and agriculture. Um, I'm just showing you the middle, middle of the road scenario, the SSP2 result for my own team. Uh, when we elaborated the energy scenario, we do, do, we do this for 26 world regions. This is only showing you the, the global results uh, with the development of electricity demand into the future, which is growing the fastest and also energy demand in other sectors. Yeah, and then we also elaborate this in terms of uh, projections for energy supply. Uh, here you see uh, SSP1 to SSP5. Um, in these scenarios, in the absence of climate uh, policy, we actually find that uh, there will be a further increase in global energy use. And in the absence of climate policy, you see much stronger growth of renewables than from other sources, but still fossil fuels would uh, remain dominant. And as a result, also greenhouse gas emissions would increase. Yeah, we did the same also for agriculture. And so based on population projections, projections in income, we projected uh, consumption of agricultural agriculture commodities. In the case of our own model, uh, we also need to um, allocate this to a grid and we model the land use and the agriculture activities associated with this. Uh, and which would, for, for instance, look like this. Uh, here we, we see for the SSP2 scenario, the change over time uh, from 2015 to 2050. And the thing really to notice is the expansion of agriculture area projected in Af Africa, uh, which is logical given the large increase in population size in that region. Uh, 
and also the projected increase in income. And, and as a result, a major loss in, in forest areas, now, which would even continue if you would move to uh, 2100. You see also some uh, loss of the forest area in South America, but it's not much less extensive. Yeah, and that's, this was the SSP2 scenario, but we also developed this for SSP1 and SSP3. And if you remember, the SSP1 scenario was this lower population uh, growth uh, in combination with an, an orientation towards sustainable development. And so instead of a decrease of forest area, actually this scenario shows you by 2100 an increase in forest area. But while the SSP3 scenario, this is the scenario where the global world goes to 12 billion by the end of the century, and we see even a much stronger expansion of agriculture. Now, from our projections on energy and land use, it's quite easy to calculate implications for emissions. And so, in the, you first have the graph on the uh, emission projection for SSP2, but on the right, we have the uh, uh, graphs for the SSP1 to SSP5. You see actually a set of lines. Some of them are from my own modeling team, the image team, uh, but uh, all these scenarios have been elaborated by multiple teams, uh, which gives you some ideals of the robustness. Um, now, if we now focus for a second to that middle line, the SSP2 scenario, uh, which is that line that is simply slowly increasing over time. Uh, that's, that's shown here. Um, and what we see is that historically CO2 emissions have always increased with one major exception uh, in 2020 when emissions went down as a result of the, of the uh, COVID pandemic. And then we see a continuation again based on the SSP2. Now, so we can also cal uh, calculate the climate consequences for this. One route is actually to send the information to large climate models, but we can even get a peak review of this by simply having a look at the most important relationship that comes out of these big climate models, which is this graph that was, shown, was published first by IPCC and AR5, where we plot on the one hand the cumulative CO2 emissions of different scenarios, and on the other hand, the temperature increase that comes out of these uh, global models. And you see a relationship indicated by the lines, and hopefully you can also see this pink plume around it which is the uncertainty. It's different models. And so the, we have the most sensitive climate models on the top, uh, showing uh, a, re a relatively rapid increase for temperature for, uh, with respect to cumulative CO2 emissions that are put into the atmosphere. And on the low end, we have the, less, the least sensitive models. And now we can take this graph uh, as it's produced by the climate models and calculate the cumulative CO2 emissions that we get under the this scenario, which would be around four to 5,000 gigatons of CO2, and put it into this particular graph. And you can see that the expected temperature increase from such a development would be around three to five degrees. Now, we already know from our very first slide uh, that this is not something that we want as, as a world. And we already promised ourselves that we wanted to go stay well below two degrees and preferably at 1.5 degrees. We can use the same slide now to calculate how much CO2 emissions we can actually still emit to achieve this. And so for well below two degrees, this is around a thousand gigatons of CO2. Um, and for 1.5 degrees, this is around 400 gigatons of CO2. Uh, taken from the graph and uh, actually I read it now at one third of the models being left of the point where I, I read it and two thirds uh, on the right, giving us a two thirds chance that we actually need the goals. Now, what is a thousand gigatons of CO2? It's not a lot. And we are emitting now at the moment, every year, more than 40 gigatons of CO2. And so if we go from now back to zero linearly and emit a thousand gigatons of CO2, it looks like the graph on the left, the red line. It means that we have to be at zero in about 45 years, which is really fast, uh, given the fact that if we build infrastructure, most of the time, we expect that infrastructure to be around there for at least 40 years. Uh, so basically, it means 
we have to stop, start building everything CO2 neutral from today onwards, not only in the OECD countries, but globally. Yeah, for the, for the 1.5 degree scenario, it's actually going back to zero in 18 years. Now we can actually calculate the CO2 emissions from existing infrastructure. And so the existing uh, uh, power plants, the existing uh, factories and calculate how much CO2 emissions would be associated with leaving them until the end of the lifetime. And that would be uh, according to a paper in, I think ERL a few years ago, uh, 650 gigatons of CO2. And so that is already more than the 1.5 degree budget. So we know that if you want to meet that budget, in principle, you have to decommission existing infrastructure before it leads to the end of the lifetime. There is one but, and that is actually, it is also possible to take CO2 from the atmosphere. It's not that difficult. Uh, one of the ways to do it is to uh, reforest the planet. Uh, then we are already having negative emissions. Another way to do it is by energy with CCS. And then there are more advanced uh, technologies that are still in the development and might become available. Uh, so there are estimates of how much we could actually get with these uh, technologies. Many of them use land and are therefore restricted uh, in their potential. Some of them are based on putting CO2 underground, uh, which also means that you are restricted by the amount of storage capacity. And so basically we estimate that a few hundred gigatons of CO2 that we could extract from the atmosphere is, is already quite a lot. And there are uh, a few additional reasons for that. Uh, in addition to the, the potential that I just already discussed, it also automatically means that there would be a temporary, temporary overshoot of the temperature target. And there are also possible negative impacts if we are basing uh, these negative emissions on land use like reforestation. Right? And so a few hundreds of gigatons of CO2, it help, would help a lot, as you can see on the lines that I, I'm just showing. Um, at the same time, uh, remember that we had four to 5,000 gigatons of CO2 in the non-climate action scenario. We need to go back to uh, around four to a thousand, 400 to 1,000 gigatons of CO2. So the most important part of the story is simply preventing positive emissions, but in the end, negative emissions might help to make the final mile. And so we can now start using models and to fill this in. Can models find solutions of pathways that are consistent with this? And now the models can then try to find solutions in terms of energy systems and land use that uh, are indeed consistent with, for instance, the 400 gigaton CO2. And uh, there is some distribution in, uh, within time possible and you can start early and then maybe relax a bit later on. You can also do the opposite. And that gives this lines that are shown here. In addition, uh, we can play a little bit with CO2 versus non-CO2 emission reductions, which means that there are different points in time that you would achieve net zero emissions to be consistent with a two, two degree or the 1.5 degree target. It's about 26 to 2080 for uh, well below two degrees, it's about 1 point, uh, 2035 to 2060 for the 1.5 degree target. Uh, so we can, as I indicated, uh, use models to find solutions that are consistent with this. And I'm showing that on the next few slides. And so here we have a, a current policy scenario. This is this the SSP2 scenario again where we see emissions increasing. These are the global greenhouse gas emissions. And you see that most of the uh, emissions actually come from the energy sector, electricity production, blue, and from non-CO2. Uh, this is total greenhouse gases, uh, which is indicated in gray. And then uh, globally, industry is also important. Buildings seems a bit low, but please realize that the uh, emissions from the energy sector are electricity production, which are consumed also in the other sectors. Yeah, the picture looks like that if you plot the same scenario in terms of the global energy use that is associated with uh, that uh, uh, trajectory. Now let's now focus for a second only on 2050 and 2100. Uh, this is done here. Yeah, so it we have like the same data. Shop, which I can't do in your country, I'm on the device yet. 
For now, go to your know. preferred Amazon site or to the Amazon app. So, so um, the, um, what I'm now using is the model is to um, um, make scenarios that are consistent with 1.5 using the model as a solution. And one of the solutions that the model would find is um, the option of uh, using CCS. And so here in this scenario, I've assumed that CCS is available. As a result, it combines it with bioenergy, which gives negative emissions. You can see that in the 2100 graph. And this scenario is consistent with 1.5. But maybe that technology is not available. And, and so we can also run the scenario, the, the same models, but assuming that renewables might develop quickly and they can uh, be easily integrated into the system. And we can also develop scenarios that potentially have low energy demand. Yeah, so three different solutions of staying within 1.5 degree and where the model can show some of the consequences. And some of these consequences are, for instance, if you look at the middle graph, the high level of bioenergy use, yeah, where uh, we need land. And is this land available? Uh, on, the, on the right side, uh, we have this low energy demand scenario. Now, can we actually see that's happening socially? And can we combine it with goals of make, giving access to energy, modern energy for everyone? And for instance, on the left, uh, we have, um, sorry, the middle graph is showing the renewables. Um, there too, uh, we have questions on whether that can be achieved in terms of metals, for instance, that are needed. If you, so I was now emphasizing the differences between these scenarios, but you can also use the same set of scenarios to uh, see where they are similar. And so we know that any scenario that achieves well below two or 1.5, first of all, needs to limit demand. Yeah, because if that continues to increase on the supply side, at some point, the solution becomes simply unfeasible. We also know that renewable energy is in all scenarios plays a major role. And that is partly simply because of the cost reductions that we have seen for uh, wind and solar power over the last few years. We know that electrification is important. That's simply based on the fact that it's relatively easy to get the electricity sector to zero. And then you might as well try to profit from that uh, in terms of uh, electrifying as much as possible energy demand. We also know that um, it, it will re require also other things than renewables. Uh, we have to solve system integration of renewables, but we also have to think of uh, possible other technologies that can provide more uh, reliable capacity. So possibly CCS or bioenergy or nuclear power. And then in end use, there are also a few uh, energy demand uh, functions uh, where it's unlikely that electrification could play a role. High, e high heat, for instance, uh, high temperature uh, appliances, uh, applications, for instance. And there we need other things like hydrogen or CCS options, maybe bioenergy. Reforestation in all scenarios played a major role, possibly negative emissions. And so if so, we might want to invest now already in trying to develop the technology because we might need it into the future. Non-CO2 plays a major role. And then there's one thing that I would like to emphasize uh, simply because it's, for non-CO2, it's so unlikely that we bring them to zero. Uh, methane emissions, for instance, technically, uh, the methane emissions technically associated with livestock 50% emission reduction is already quite a lot. Yeah, so if you want to achieve more there, then diet change might be a very attractive part of the solution too. So I focus now so far on climate. So I would like to spend the last 10 minutes um, trying to go in to see what it means to go beyond climate with scenario analysis. And I was showing you all these uh, increasing graphs for energy use so far, but um, this is a, a graph from the uh, IRP, the uh, International Panel on uh, the Resource Panel, and they made similar graphs for material use. Uh, here you can see historically how material use have increased over time. And these are related to lots of things that we do as, as humans. Uh, our transport, what we eat, how we live, uh, providing the infrastructure and energy, energy for goods. Yeah, and in the Energy in the models that I've uh, concentrated so far on, uh, 
have been mostly looking into energy use and how these different activities are related to each other in terms of energy. But they are actually connected in many other ways. They are connected in terms of water, uh, water consumption for energy, but water consumption directly for residential, but water consumption as well for agriculture. They're connected in terms of uh, biomass, uh, the, the green arrows moving from crop and animals, mostly to residential, but also partly uh, into the energy system. And in terms of land use, the yellow arrows. And so if we really want to describe the system well, we need to understand all these arrows and the possibilities of trying to influence them. Now, one focus area here might be to start focusing also on the relationship between materials and energy. And so far in, in the model that I'm the, working with, but this is actually most true for most of the models used for IPC, the system looks like something like this. Now we have energy for industry and some of that materials are in use and then go to a waste stage. But ideally, you, you might want to describe the system much more in a way that is shown here, where in, in addition to in use, uh, you could also recycle uh, those materials, bring it back to industry and look at uh, material use more from a circular uh, economy perspective. And then in that case, we want to see the implications of increasing circular economy for energy use and the advantages that it might provide. But we might also want to look into the implications of the energy transition climate policy for material use. And for instance, the, the use of scarce metals for uh, an energy transition. There's a paper by Dave Monetal, for instance, that, that did the, le the latter thing. While there's a nice paper by Stephen Pauliou published this year, where he looked into the possibilities of circular economy for climate policy. I think this is a really important area where we should uh, continue to, to focus on. But this is uh, materials. And obviously, we need to broaden this and also look at land and water. This is a, a research paper by uh, Dulman et al, where he worked with the image team and a team in Germany uh, from the Potsdam Institute to look into scenarios that would try to meet water, biodiversity, food, and climate goals. And he does this with four scenarios. One scenario that is mostly focused on water, uh, where, where water extraction is limited. Uh, um, the second scenario is a, a scenario where we focus on land and where we uh, pre prevent, uh, bi uh, protect biodiversity by all kinds of uh, reserves. There's a third scenario where we focus on eradicating hunger. And this is done mostly by introducing this um, diet with lower meat consumption and also reducing food waste. And then there's a fourth scenario where we mostly look at meeting climate goals. And what he did in the image model, but also in other, uh, the, the Potsdam team as well, is to focus on the impacts of these scenarios actually uh, on, the, on the indicators that are uh, used for the other uh, scenarios. So here we see the five scenarios there are the bars, and then we see the impact of these scenarios for natural land area. And actually in this particular case, we see that most of these scenarios would lead to more natural land, that the climate policy scenario would, would pro promote uh, reforestation, the scenario that is eradicating hunger because it's doing it via diet change is also leaving uh, more area uh, available for reforestation. And so, in this case, we see synergies between the scenarios as they are implemented. Now, we did that actually for all the goals, and we didn't get synergies everywhere. Uh, we saw, also saw trade-offs. Uh, here, we, we mapped them for the two different models, the image model and the MagPy model. And green was a synergy that we found, and in red, we are showing trade-offs. And uh, so, for instance, the climate scenario is showing you a trade-off, uh, partly because of the bioenergy, mostly because of the bioenergy expansion requiring, requiring irrigation. And the climate scenario is also showing a trade-off with, with uh, food production in this case, simply because of the expansion of bioenergy as well. And so there are synergies and trade-offs shown here. Now, if you want to continue on this line, so we, we're now expanding it to four different uh, goals, but you obviously want to try to indicate, uh, to look at all the possible SDGs. And then um, 
the SDGs, there are 17 of them. If you look at the, uh, how the UN has published underlying objectives, and they have published 169 targets, uh, at some point it just becomes completely impossible for uh, analysts to look at. Uh, so there is a paper now uh, under review uh, where we had tried to select two goals per SDG, so at least limit this problem to around 40 indicators that might say something about whether we achieve the SDGs or not. And the point that I would like to make is that we asked different modeling teams, how well are you modeling these indicators and uh, specifically um, the, uh, the SDG itself? And uh, the modeling teams were allowed to give a score of zero to five for where, how well they were modeling these indicators and um, these uh, er areas. Now, I, I assume that the score that is below two is relatively low. Right? Just look at where the models are strong and where the models are weak. Now, the models are relatively strong in representing earth systems and resource use, right? that's, that's food uh, and energy. They indicate that they're really weak within the Earth system on marine environment, but they are also really weak on human development uh, and, and to some degree governance. Eh? And so clearly models still need to improve if we want to really make sure that we can represent the SDGs well, or alternatively, which might be maybe even a more attractive route, that we need to ensure that we have collaboration between the modelers and social sciences to represent these SDGs well. Uh, so this is my last slide. And so I think it is important for us uh, as a community to try and tie the knot and to look into possible routes that are available to meet multiple goals and to see whether we can contribute to bend the trend from further degradation into the, uh, uh, the direction that uh, we have promised ourselves as a world. We have a lot of experience on single issue scenarios like in climate, but there is relatively also a lot of work on uh, food modeling on biodiversity, but much less so is done on the connections. And for instance, IPBES and, and IPC saw themselves forced this year to publish uh, a press conference where they said they were, go were going to collaborate in the future. And obviously, you might argue that that should have been done much earlier, but okay, this is important. And it means that if we as a community want to do this, it might be good if we make sure that we also share knowledge. That could be uh, using common scenarios. Eh? The more we all use a, a, a common scenario set, then the easier we talk to each other. It means that we have to, uh, to link different types of research, especially, if, uh, as I argued before, between social sciences and natural sciences, but also in different research foci. Eh? So, for instance, the people working on circular economy uh, that, that has become a community by itself uh, and the, the relationships between integrated assessment modeling and circular economy modeling are not that strong yet. Uh, so that's something that we need to see whether how we, how we can make that stronger. And at least as important, certainly for Nexus issue, is to learn across scale. And most of the Nexus work, work is not done at the global scale, but at the local scale. And how can we sh make sure that these global scenarios are useful for local scale analysis? where really we see the nexus issues, but at the same time, how can we make sure that the knowledge that is developed at the local scale is also seen by the global modelers? Uh, I think that is an important research agenda, and I would like to share it to, to hear your questions. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Furen, for a very enlightening lecture. So, as we saw, there is a, a strong need, even imperative, to do the integrated assessment of these sustainable development goals and challenges on a global scale, which sometimes go beyond technical and economic issues. I won't uh, uh, still further time, but I would like to give the auditorium uh, to put uh, questions and comments, please. Yes, please. 
ontwikkelen. Voilà. For us as uh, outside uh, Dubrovnik, it's not possible to hear you. So I would like to ha ask the chair to repeat your question. No. No, I, can you repeat it, please? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. OK, great. So I speak louder. OK, I was speaking about business mega trend. And there was IT as a business mega trend. After that, sustainability as a business mega trend. And now every of us can see and feel that COVID become a business mega trend. And it is not that we throw out the previous business mega trend, I mean for research. For example, for IT, still we are continuing. And for sustainability, still we are continuing. But now the trend become COVID. So in all aspects of these uh, goals for United Nations, COVID has impact, and, and here we, we can really feel it. You are the other side of the world, and we are the other side of the world, and we have to use masks, and all, all aspect of our life is uh, committed to the COVID, in, impacted by COVID. So I would like to know, with this research and interesting topic that you introduced, how you intertwine uh, this topic and sustainability with COVID. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very good question, and it's actually quite challenging too. Um, so I I agree with you that uh, COVID could have uh, important uh, consequences for the, the developments that I have shown, and um, in the chat there's uh, also a question specifically on, on projected population growth. Maybe there, luckily enough. It, the impact might be uh, hopefully not be the, the most important, but it can it can much more influence certainly in the next ten years uh, socioeconomic development, uh, the way we and it, but possibly also the way that we live. Uh, the fact that uh, we are going to do, for instance, more uh, remote working, but um, so um, the challenging part is that um, while we it, we are developing these scenarios to be prepare ourselves for the future. And at the same time, with respect to COVID, there is also so much uncertain that, that um, it's really relatively difficult to bring this uh, into account uh, uh, immediately into the scenarios. And we have so, we have now seen a, uh, some publications coming out of uh, teams looking into this and showing possible consequences. Uh, first of all, for the SDGs. And we know that here we see the, a direct competition with all the investments and, and, and slow down economic growth uh, for uh, meeting the, uh, several of the SDG goals. Uh, and so there, there's really an urgent situation. Uh, but secondly, we saw also teams looking into the question, uh, what does uh, different working ways of working, different uh, travel patterns mean? I think it's very important work. I think it also, we need to see how the what, what direction this further develops, and then hopefully at some point it is also integrated into the more community type of scenarios. Uh, but but at the moment, uh, it's not fully integrated yet. Okay, thank you. I, I think we have another question. Natasha, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Wuren, for excellent presentation. I, I was uh, very uh, happy to hear that, uh, particularly in the last part of your presentation, that uh, a lot of work is ongoing regarding introduction of uh, new uh, targets uh, going beyond mitigation scenario and represented uh, concentration pathways. Uh, so new targets of the models uh, to deal with uh, human development or water or some other dimension of sustainable development goals. So my question uh, would be to show us some example, for example, how you introduce uh, uh, the, the goals for scenarios for some other dimension, not only for mitigation, like mitigation and represented concentration pathways, but how, with which variables you use to introduce, for example, uh, any other goals beyond uh, mitigation. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you for your question. I, I tried to already say something on that uh, in the last few uh, slides. Eh? And so relatively easy still uh, for this type of models would be to also focus on uh, biodiversity goals uh, and uh, food and uh, energy access. Those are still relatively close where uh, earlier these models have focused on, uh, which is on climate. And so for biodiversity, and so what we can do is to uh, are different different things. So, so what we, we did in the paper that was uh, by Doolman et al, we uh, really in, included uh, nature reserves. So we protected uh, several parts of the planet uh, for use by both agriculture production or production of um, bioenergy. Uh, as a result, it has economic consequences in the scenarios, um, and uh, that and we can but we can then also meet both a climate goal and a, and a biodiversity goal. Similarly, in that scenario too, where we can explore the impacts of diet change, uh, either driven uh, by um, the um, uh, protection of reserves, but also as, as simply as a as a measure on its own. Um, for biodiversity, we also uh, are exploring the, uh, the impacts of reducing air, uh, air pollution. Uh, we can also look into um, uh, uh, reducing food waste. And so there are different uh, places in the model where we can in introduce additional action to explore these goals. The same for water scarcity. Uh, here too, uh, the models have skill. And so we can uh, um, in the, uh, look into uh, increased efficiency, for instance. Um, wh where it becomes increasingly difficult uh, is to represent uh, also human development goals. Some of the models are more economic oriented uh, and might uh, look into distribution questions. Um, in our case, we have a bit more biophysical oriented model. And so we are now in indicating uh, food consumption patterns and energy consumption patterns per income group, and therefore look into uh, yeah poverty in a in a, in a multi-dimensional concept, um, which would be access to food, access to water, access to um, uh, 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 energy. Yeah, so I think there are many ways that we can start uh, exploring these scenarios, and I think it is important. Um, yeah, at some point it's much more showing different pathways than doing full optimization because it's uh, the optimization itself becomes a bit more meaningless i i would say it's much more showing the consequences of different pathways than trying to uh, have a model finding a, a, a somewhat obscure single solution in a, in a where in an area where we actually need to, to see the synergies and trade-offs Thank you. And that look, uh, there was another question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for excellent lecture. Um, one thing about uh, land, uh, land will be competing for different uh, possible uses. You already mentioned that, uh, biodiversity, food production, biomass production. Um, how much do you see uh, the new technology of laboratory grown meat coming? Uh, what about vertical ag ag agriculture? We would need uh, some kind of financial mechanisms to make it come on the markets faster. What about carbon pricing in the food? Do you see these options coming? Yes, um, I, I think. First of all, it's really important to explore the consequences of uh, scenarios like that. And, we, and that's still also relatively easy. There are a few pa papers that have looked into lab-grown meat, for instance. Um, and in, in such a situation, you still need agriculture production eh, to uh, feed the, um, the, the labs uh, with uh, uh, input. Uh, but uh, it can be much more efficient uh, than other forms of agriculture. And I think it is important to see uh, how such systems would look like. And then obviously the next step would be also to think of uh, policy measures that could, if we would like to, stimulate directions. In, in, uh, and, but, but, it, but we should be looking into the 
the trade-offs and the synergies of uh, such scenarios, which could also be, uh, for instance, the role of agriculture in, in, in landscape um, protection. Um, so I, I, I personally, uh, with all the options that you mentioned, I think they are should be considered, they should be explored. And, uh, and um, with respect to the carbon pricing of food, um, yeah, so I'm not entirely sure whether that is the most appropriate instrument. Um, I, I, I see the importance of making sure that uh, agriculture systems contribute uh, fit into a climate neutral world. With, uh, with carbon pricing, obviously, you would translate that price also to everyone, including uh, people that, with a lower income. Um, and um, then you have to find uh, ways to compensate there as well again. Uh, so maybe finding other instruments than price instruments in this case is more appropriate. Yeah, thank you. And do we have some other questions? Maybe. Yeah. We are almost uh, at the end of the, the lecture, but if there is some more question or... No? Yeah. We have uh, two questions from uh, our uh, audience online. Uh, so first set of questions is from Professor Liliana Pruskuryakova. Uh, with the present pandemic, perhaps we cannot be certain anymore about the projected population growth. Do you have a comment on that? Yes, and I quickly indicated that the pandemic is probably very important for lots of things, but maybe uh, population growth at the moment, luckily enough, is not the most important thing to take into account, but much more our lifestyles and socioeconomic development. Yeah, the second question, shall I read it? Because I can also see them. Uh -huh. uh, of, course, of course, if you can. So the second question asked by Liana Puskurikova is, is how does the model takes into account weak signals and wildcards that are and may affect uh, all uh, projections? Yeah. So I think there there is a strength of, of, of these models. So in principle, if you use the models as they are, they mostly focus on uh, simply uh, average trends. And there, but. Um, once you have scenarios, once you have uh, created uh, projections, you could, can start thinking of what, what if I would be really replace something with something like lab grown meat or diet change or uh, assuming that uh, there is a, a very different agriculture system. And so then we can start to see the consequences of some of those by introducing those into the model and yeah. uh, see how this, those play out. And sometimes they are different than expected. Eh? For instance, uh, the water consumption consequences of some of the mitigation scenarios where you see an increase of water consumption, which you might not have expected in the first place. And then the final question um, in this chat was, um, the, what is the most urgent action that we need now? I'm not sure that I can answer it in that particular way, because I think there is multiple areas uh, what, uh, where I think we should be going for. Now, personally, for me, it, it is important to move away from a climate-only agenda um, in the case of uh, the, 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 uh, the work that I presented early in the presentation and make sure that we do look into this multiple goal uh, perspective and realize that we need to uh, meet uh, climate goals, uh, development goals, and biodiversity goals and, uh, and, and things like that. But at least as important is, for instance, the question how to implement these uh, scenarios. We know that technically and economically a lot is possible. In reality, a lot, not a lot is happening. And so social science research on feasibility, social support, uh, incentives are at least as important than anything that I presented today. Okay, if there is no other questions and comments, uh, unfortunately our time ran out, so now our, our, our lunch is waiting. I would like to thank once again to Professor Van Fuyren. Thank you for excellent presentation. <clears throat> and also thank to the audience who participated in the good comments and questions. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.